Policymaker Town Hall on Obesity. I'm very excited to talk about today's topic with you all. I am Heather Drake, the Membership Manager for the Maine Public Health Association. And again, I want to thank you for being here and for taking time out of what we know. Everyone has a very busy, busy schedule, so we appreciate you um, coming to learn more about obesity. I'd also like to thank our obesity member section. Uh, they're the group that put together today's program, as well as a fact sheet that we will have. Uh, we'll link to it at the end of the presentation and send it around to registrants and policymakers as well. And the fact sheet covers the topic of obesity, including its impact with COVID and policy solutions, which we'll talk about at the end of today's presentation. Um, a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. And as we do that, Becca, if you don't mind administering, we have a very, very short pre-assessment just to gauge people's understanding of obesity as we go into today's presentation and we'll do a post-assessment at the end. Um, but while that's popping up, just to let you know, we are recording today's presentation. Um, so if there's any problems with that, just jump off now. Um, it will be available later today on our website, which we'll also link to at the end of the presentation. And again, we'll pass that along with the fact sheet that we've developed, sending it to all registrants and legislators as well. But we also encourage you to uh, forward the recording to your legislator too as a way to get the information out there and make sure that our policymakers are aware and understanding of this issue. Today's presentation is um, one of a series that the obesity member section will be putting together. So it's, it's meant to be an overview and a teaser for topics to come. But as we go through today's presentation, if you have there are topics that we talk about that you'd like to learn more about or ones that we don't address related to obesity, please put that into the chat and we'll be monitoring those and we'll take them into consideration as we continue to plan this series. And please just stay on a lookout for more information on those series dates and what that will look like. Um, you should all be muted, but if you aren't, we ask that you do stay muted for the duration of the presentation just to limit any background noise. Um, we're a pretty intimate group this morning, so when we get to Q&A, which will be at the end of, end of the presentations, you can take yourself off mute if you have a question, but otherwise, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. Um, and so with that, I think that's all for housekeeping. I'd like to introduce this morning's panel. Um, so we have Dr. Vale O'Hara, who is the medical director with the Well for Wellness Clinic at Penobscot Community Health Center. Dr. Tara Witten, who is um, an assistant professor of health administration at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. We're also joined by Renee Page, executive director of the Healthy Communities of the Capital Area, and Dr. Becca Bolas, executive director of the Maine Public Health Association. And we also wanna take just a few minutes to ground everyone in the levels of prevention as they relate to public health. Um, we know public health can be a confusing topic if, if it's new to you. So we just wanna take a minute to, to go over this. So you can see in front of you, we have some people walking towards the edge of a cliff. And this is adapted from Dr. Kamara Jones's cliff analogy of good health. And so if these folks in these this analogy continue to walk, they're going to fall off the cliff. And we can only imagine what might happen to them if they reach the bottom of, of the ground. And, and we don't want that to happen. So what we have in terms of public health is what we call um, tertiary prevention. So this is things like medical care, as it says on the screen. It might be an ambulance that picks up the people once they've fallen and takes them to, um, to a hospital to get care and treatment. And so when we think about tertiary prevention in terms of obesity, which is today's topic, that might be something like bariatric surgery. So we're preventing them and, and anything from happening beyond that, but it's a, it's a third level. So we don't necessarily want people to get to that third level. So when we think about our cliff, what can we do to help prevent people from, from getting to the ambulance and needing the ambulance? And that's where we have secondary prevention. So we put up a net to catch the people before they fall all the way down to the ground. So with the obesity example, this might be a weight management clinic. So you're, again, trying to prevent them to getting to needing that third level of care and really working towards promoting optimal health. 
but again, we want, we want to keep people from getting there. So how do we, how do we prevent people from need, even needing the secondary prevention? And that's where we have primary prevention and we put up a fence to keep people from falling off the cliff in the first place. So primary prevention is where we'll, we'll, we'll focus today's conversations and that could be programs that promote things like walkability and bikeability when we're thinking about obesity prevention. And Renee will talk about that a bit more on our panel. Um, so we have our three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And again, really each one just trying, trying to keep people healthier and getting them, preventing them from needing, needing that extra level of prevention. But what we also have in this diagram are social determinants of health. So social determinants of health, if you're unfamiliar, are places where we live, work, play, age, worship. Um, they might be things like uh, quality of schools, um, housing, wages. And, and many of you may have heard that your zip code is a, a better predictor of your health outcomes than your genetic code. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about social determinants of health. Those are things that are beyond our, um, our individual control in many ways. So when we address social determinants of health, we help keep people from getting even close to the fence. So we're pulling, pulling them away from the fence, pulling them away from that opportunity to potentially fall. And that's what we like to do in public health. But we also have um, social determinants of equity. And so this might be something that's actually pushing people towards the fence. So these are our, our systems, our resource distribution, our policies that um, promote health disparities. So when we think about public health, we wanna make sure that we're addressing equity, looking at um, approaches from a population level, from a systematic level, so that we're addressing um, everyone equitably, because even within social determinants of health, you know, we might have people who are, who have access to better quality schools than others, and that'll change their health outcomes. So when we address all of these things together, equity, social determinants of health, we have um, a holistic public health prevention system. So that's really just, you know, to, to tee things up for today's conversation and to um, remember where we are in this level and obesity can touch on all three levels of prevention. But today, again, we'll be focusing on primary prevention. And so I will send it over to Becca, who will talk about the complexities of obesity before we get into our panel. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so yes, this is a somewhat overwhelming uh, systems map. This was published by the Foresight Group, which is based in the UK in 2007. And um, the reason that I'm showing you, we're showing you this uh, very, like I said, very, very complicated systems map is really just to illustrate all the different factors that connect to our weight status. Um, and in the, the cliff analogy that Heather was just walking through, you may have noticed that the three stick figures were all different colors. Um, and that's because we all have individual characteristics with our, our biology, um, our physiology, all these different um, internal factors that can interact with our environment. And Val is going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but that really, those individual characteristics are important. And in this, this map, that's what those dark orange colors are right in the middle. Um, and so we'll touch upon that just a little bit today. But as Heather said, mostly we're going to be talking about other, other areas of influence. And that's what those bigger circles are. So looking at individual activity, our environment, um, our psychology, our social networks, and the types of foods that we eat and, um, and the types of foods that are available to us. And so those are where we're thinking about social determinants of health um, and then the different types of, of prevention to, to encourage people to have or to create environments where people can have um, a healthy weight status. Again, recognizing some individual, you know, there is individual variation um, just at a um, physiological level. So I, I share this really just to illustrate just how complex uh, our weight status is. It seems like it shouldn't be, but there are so many factors that can impact it. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. O'Hara to, to kick us off with talking a little bit about some of these internal mechanisms that can influence our weight status. Great. Thank you, Becca. Yes. Um, so we're going to talk about obesity just briefly uh, by de defining it, but also acknowledging that we've learned so much about the disease of obesity and the pathophysiology that underlies a lot of what we see. And again, uh, future 
discussions and breakout series, we can go a deeper dive because clearly we're not going to be leaving here as physiologists, obviously, but really just to be aware that there is pathophysiology that relates to this disease. Um, next slide, Heather. So obesity is defined as a complex chronic relapsing disease where excess body fat mass leads to multiple physiological impairments. And the disease of obesity increases our risk of developing so many other chronic diseases and is sadly associated with increasing early mortality, morbidity, and redu reduced quality of life. Next slide. So when we study physiology, we, we know that our body likes to find this homeostasis or balance. And the body seeks a stable fat mass, just as other regulated tissues do, much of which is at the subconscious level through these homeostatic physiological biofeedback mechanisms. Just like if we donate red blood cells, we regenerate that and we're not necessarily consciously thinking about that. And so there's multiple areas of redundancy to protect that. Next slide. And when we look at main obesity data, and we've all seen the state you know, country maps changing colors. But when we look at our own main da data, almost 700,000 adults and 84,000 children in the state of Maine have overweight or obesity. And sadly, over the last 30, 40 years, some populations have not only doubled but tripled. And currently in pediatrics, the fastest growing subgroup is severe obesity for our children. Next slide. So we've learned a lot about the energy regulatory system, and that is the system that is uh, mainly controlled in the brain and the hypothalamus, and it feeds back from the periphery through those hormonal controls that you see on, on the left. This is not an all-inclusive list, list, obviously, but this comes in to inform the brain about what energy is out there and whether or not we can use energy. We also see on the right-hand side, we have the cognitive brain where we have the prefrontal cortex. That's informing us about behavior changes, education. A lot of our public health messages uh, arrive through the processes of the prefrontal cortex. We also have the reward center or the hedonic reward center, which you know, responds to the salience or palatability of foods that are out there. And this all comes into the central nervous system. And in addition to that, we have environmental modulation, which is the focus of much of our public health work, looking at food quality, food availability, as Heather said, bike paths, walkability, um, stress, which we've all seen the impact of COVID pandemic um, that negatively impacts the disease of obesity. And there's crosstalk amongst all of these areas that leads to the complexity of the disease of obesity. Next slide. So we see uh, 236, or more comorbidities that are associated with the disease of obesity. Not one organ system or medical specialty has been spared when patients are struggling with the disease of obesity. Next slide. So we've kind of looked at obesity as sort of obesities or different phenotypes. Not, so not only are you an apple or a pear, but maybe what kind of apple are you? And this really results from different triggers or different areas of dysfunction within that very complex system that may present uh, as one patient's obesity. And it also speaks to the need for variable prevention measures as well as treatment measures because everybody's gonna respond differently to different interventions because of that variability that Becca talked about before. Next slide. So what is the basis of this heterogeneity? Well, variable patient biology is a very key part of this and there's multiple sources of variation and we're learning so much more about these. Uh, for example, different obesity predisposing genetics through the GWAS studies, we've learned that 900 plus loci are actually associated with increased risk for elevated BMI. And we also see there are some genetic alleles that may be protective against obesity, even in this environment of uh, obesogenic environment, such as the ALK gene, and learning from them can inform us as well. And then we can also look at different developmental exposures, such as the in utero experience um, and different impacts there that affect that even unborn baby, as well as those different environmental exposures that we're talking so much about today as well. Next slide. So to summarize, two key points that I'm gonna leave with, because this is a very complicated conversation, but obesity is um, a complex disease that results from a failure of this complex energy regulatory system that we're talking about to function normally. And when this dysfunction happens anywhere along that path, that drives some of the behaviors we see. And that therefore our therapeutic algorithms from prevention all the way to treatment must be determined by all of this. And my hope is that this additional data adds an adju a vital adjunct to what we're talking about. 
highlighting those Mainers that those 690,000 adults and 84,000 children, those are our families and our patients. And the need to treat their disease can prevent their future children from stepping into the same risk. And I think that is yet another vital tool in our prevention toolbox. And so uh, as uh, Becca uh, Heather said earlier, there's more information at the obesity Co and COVID fact sheet on our website. And I'll pass it now to Tara from UMaine. All right, thank you, Dr. O'Hara. My name is Dr. Tara Witten, and I'm an assistant professor of community health at UMaine Presque Isle. Um, so I'm going to give the beginning of an overview for public health approaches to addressing obesity. So stay tuned for more information on this later at a later date. Very simply, the equation to maintain energy balance for a healthy weight and health status is energy intake is equal to energy expenditure. And most of us know that. But it's far more complex than it looks when we're considering the multitude of genetic, biological, psychological, sociocultural, and environmental factors that affect both sides of that equation, like Dr. O'Hara was alluding to. Um, we also need to consider the interrelationships between all of those different factors. So it's much more complex than just energy intake is equal to energy expenditure. So this model that we're looking at here is called the social ecological model, and we use this model to understand influencers of obesity from a population health approach, as each of these overlapping rings in the model illustrate how factors at one level influence factors at another level. It's all interrelated. We used to identify individual health behaviors as the principal determinants of a health status, but we now understand that individual behaviors do not always arise in an isolated vacuum, but rather that they're conditioned by social and physical environments in which we live. So in order to focus on some of these individual health behaviors, we really must broaden our perspectives, um, for example, to these outer rings in this diagram to address the social determinants of health. So for example, those that lie outside of the individual and are beyond genetic and individual behaviors. Um, in addition to this, we must also focus on social equity across these factors from both so, um, economic and social standpoints. And so now I will pass this off to Renee Page. Thanks, Tara. Um, that was great. That was a great um, introduction for everyone. And thank you, MPHA, for hosting this important conversation. So hi, everyone. My name is Renee Page. I'm Executive Director at Healthy Communities of the Capital Area. We're based in Gardner, and we serve primarily Southern Kennebec County. Um, a little bit about HCCA. Uh, we're a community-based public health organization focused on primary prevention. So our mission is to convene and support people, organizations, and communities to collaborate on quality of life and public health issues. And we accomplish this through relationship and trust building at the community level by applying strategies to make healthier choices easier. So in addition to obesity prevention, we work on other public health issues like substance misuse, tobacco use prevention, and other public health initiatives. Um, when thinking back to the slide that Heather showed with the fence and the safety net and the ambulance, our work really happens at the top of the cliff to keep people away from the edge. And to do that within the context of the social ecological model that Tara just showed, um, we work mostly at the organizational and community levels. Um, I'll set you up. Um, so I just want to take a minute to introduce the Maine Obesity Advisory Council, or what some of us affectionately call MOAC. Um, MOAC is a group of obesity prevention experts that's convened by Maine CDC and Let's Go with the goal to reduce obesity and the associated medical conditions that result in poor health, higher medical costs, and negative impacts on quality of life in Maine. The group has five scientifically based goals that are listed here with recommendations and strategies to achieve them. Um, these goals and strategies inform the work that's happening at the local level. Uh, you can visit the website there to see more about the recommendations and the strategies aligned with each goal. Next slide. So um, these are a few examples of some of the programs, networks, and organizations that HCCA partners with to prevent obesity in Maine. 
So um, Healthy Communities of the Capital Area is home to Maine Farm to Institution and the Maine Farm to School Network. These are statewide networks working to increase access to fresh local foods in institutional meals. We are also a SNAP-Ed and a Maine Prevention Services funded Let's Go delivery site, working with community partners like schools, early care and education, uh, assisted living facilities and others to deliver nutrition education, to develop policies that support healthy choices and change environments like building school and community gardens or creating walking trails. Again, this is what we call primary prevention strategies and they're largely implemented at the organization and community levels, helping to make healthy choices easier by all. Are you picking up on the theme here? <laughs> Making healthy choices easier. So um, this is an effort really to avoid obesity and chronic disease from developing in the first place, which we know is much more cost effective. And in addition to healthcare savings and increased productivity, avoids unnecessary diminished quality of life. There are other community-based organizations across the state doing similar work that like we are, but it isn't really happening um, as comprehensively, consistently, or collaboratively as it once was. Um, and I'm happy to connect with any of you to talk more about any of the initiatives outlined on this slide, um, the goals associated with them, and how they impact obesity prevention. So last slide, yep. So what are some of the ways we can get back to doing more comprehensive obesity prevention in Maine? Um, first off, the way prevention funding is directed to the community level to do the work right now um, can be fragmented, siloed, and inconsistent, making it difficult to maintain sustainable programs and the valuable relationships to keep them going. The funding really supports backbone organizational infrastructure, uh, local level planning and assessment with community members and partners, um, or evaluation. And another gap currently is that there's no obesity prevention focus by Maine Prevention Services, and strategies are still primarily rooted in physical activity and nutrition, yet we're learning more and more, like we just heard, about other factors that contribute to obesity risk. Um, competing priorities like COVID, the opiate epidemic, and more continually shift resources and interventions from obesity work, even though obesity plays a role in negative outcomes from these competing health issues. Uh, in order to really move the needle on obesity rates in Maine, we need to get back to more of a comprehensive systems approach like Becca outlined earlier. It looks complicated, um, but really we need to do this because there is no single approach when it comes to preventing and reversing obesity. Ultimately, we know prevention is far more cost effective and for anyone who has struggled with weight issues knows, and as the data shows too, um, it's easier to prevent than try to reverse. Um, strategies that influence the overall system are far more effective than those that solely focus on individual behaviors. And before I turn it back over, I just want to mention that Maine Farm to Institution hosts a Maine Food Policy Advocacy Group, and um, I'll put a link in the chat where folks can visit the website and sign up for our newsletter that's tracking Maine um, food-related policy. So thanks. Thanks, Renee. Um, I probably should have introduced myself at the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Becca Bolas, and I am Executive Director of Maine Public Health Association. And now uh, I'm going to share with you some recommendations uh, that our member section has, has proposed. Um, and these are uh, because we're speaking to policymakers uh, and also to our members um, about some actions that, that legislators can take, but also that our, our members can help us to advocate for. Uh, so first is really around ensuring consistent funding for obesity prevention and management at the state level, and that includes building off of some of these existing successful programs. Uh, but really, we need we need funding to do this work, and that's true of all all public health areas, and certainly true in this in this case as well. Uh, we also need to improve uh, support for monitoring of obesity prevalence and obesity related chronic diseases. You heard from earlier speakers about co comorbidities. Uh, and we need to be able to track those data. And in particular, uh, it's really important to be able to track it among youth. Right now, we can't really separate it by age in a very effective way in order for us to figure out where really to target our interventions. 
Um, we also need data along these lines to be disaggregated by other demographic factors besides age, also looking at geographic area, race, ethnicity, um, disability, again, just to help us figure out where to allocate our resources. Um, and that's a need, again, across, across public health areas, but in particular with, with obesity. Um, thinking about the medical side uh, uh, would be helpful, uh, certainly to improve the accessibility of electronic health record data on obesity. Um, and to improve support for evaluation of obesity-related community programming. A lot of what Renee was talking about earlier, I mean, as you saw on that slide, there are so many partners and so many people working in this field and really being able to do a comprehensive evaluation of their efforts and how they're working in concert. Kind of going back to that systems map and just thinking about all the different pieces and all the different contributing factors, like if we're really trying to move the needle on such a complex disease, uh, we need to be able to evaluate it and we evaluate with data, we evaluate with funding, and we also evaluate it by looking at the impact that all these different partners are having um, collectively. And then lastly, uh, being able to engage local communities, uh, local partners in obesity prevention efforts, having them direct and you know, provide, <laughs> provide some insight on what's working, what's not, and what can we do to change that. Um, I will uh, also say, so this, the italicized text there at the bottom is from the, the Trust for America's Health. And what they did was an analysis to figure out what is the ROI on preventing chronic disease. And what they found was that for every dollar, just one dollar we invest in evidence-based disease prevention programming, we save $5.65 in health spending and we get back $7.50 in economic productivity. Uh, people are, are um, not having to miss work because they're sick or for other reasons. And so it really is important for us to be able to prevent chronic diseases, including obesity, um, so that we can um, have a, a healthy and, and productive workforce. Um, there are some bills that have been introduced currently this session. Uh, and it's so interesting because sometimes I don't think people realize that bills are obesity uh, related. Um, there are a couple of bills, for example, in, in the education committee around school food procurement policies, around ensuring that students have enough time for lunch. Um, so if students don't have enough time to eat, then they, they don't eat, or, or, or what they do eat may not be the healthiest thing because they're trying to eat quickly. Um, and so that can also increase food waste. Um, the, the procurement bills are around supporting local food systems and making sure that schools are able to, um, to afford and, and support farmers while also providing healthier foods for kids. Um, there will be a bill uh, hopefully heard this session if it doesn't uh, you know, get carried over, um, but around aligning school nutrition and physical act activity standards with federal standards so that you know, the smart snacks and again, ensuring that, that the foods that are available are, are healthy and that students have enough time uh, during the school week for, for physical activity. So, I mean, these are smaller, I guess, when you think about that really complex map, they have a place. I mean, there's a role for these interventions to play in, in moving the needle on preventing obesity. Um, and if we're able to, to do these efforts while also getting uh, consistent funding and improving our, our data, then we can really begin to see what's working, what's not, and how can we improve those areas that aren't working. Um, and then I guess lastly, I'll just end by saying, and when we, when we do this, when we think about what are some evidence-based strategies or what are some effective ones we can use, we do think about that, that cliff analogy that Heather showed, like we think about how can we impact equity and, and social determinants? How can we prevent it? If people have it, how can we help them manage it? And then if it gets more severe, how can we help them treat it? While at the same time, recognizing this really complex constellation of factors that impact our health status. Um, so I guess I would just end by asking uh, the, for the legislators that are, are here today or, for, or that are listening in to be uh, considering some of these um, state level policies uh, that we're recommending. And then also for our members uh, when we send out action alerts uh, to, to be reactive to those and to help us uh, really lift up the work that you're all doing so that um, policymakers are aware of it, but also that we're able to figure out how, how can we scale some of these things that are working um, and if they're not working, how can we, how can we modify them to, to help them be more effective? Um, and so I think with that, we will just end, maybe. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we're going to get into some questions. And I see a couple have come through in the chat already. First, I want to thank our panelists so much. Um, as I think we all mentioned, obesity is a complex disease. And it's in the definition that the group has prepared. 
Um, so again, we will have the series, so please stay on the lookout for that. Um, the definition that Dr. O'Hara discussed is one that the obesity member section created. So we wanted to take, um, you know, based on evidence and, and science and, and our knowledge, but we wanted to take a, a few minutes just to see if anyone had feedback on it. We want to make sure that it is a definition that people can understand and feel comfortable explaining and talking about and maybe using in their own work. So if anyone has feedback, um, we would love to hear it now. And again, we're, we're an intimate group, so please feel free to take yourself off mute or enter in anything in the chat. And if you don't have feedback, we'll just move right into our questions. And maybe you even want to give thumbs up if it makes sense. But I see Priscilla, you're off mute. Would you like to comment? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I um, I was just starting to type something in the chat and I thought, well, you, you invited us to take ourselves off mute. As an elder who's struggled with uh, overweight, obesity, to be frank, um, since middle school years, and my mom blames herself for some of my weight problems because she, she says she let me get fat as an infant. What do we know about um, uh, childhood uh, weight issues and the stigmas and the encouragements? I mean, it just is, I, I substitute teach since I retired, so I've been substitute teaching for 20 years, but um, really have uh, empathy, sympathy with the kids who are overweight and what, what can be done uh, to encourage them. Uh, I know our school district, for instance, had taken chocolate milk off the, the lunch menus and with, because of outcry from the public, they put chocolate milk back on the school menus. Are these the kinds of things that you're looking at? So Priscilla, I will just say as a provider, and I have the privilege of going into uh, my clinic and sitting down with families for the last 20 years. And first and foremost, to your history and to your experience, um, I think the most important thing that I try to tell parents who are feeling the guilt that, and, and stigma that you vocalized, the first most important thing is to say, this is not all about your fault. There's some biology. There are so many mechanisms that are different, even within one family, right? We may see one child who struggles with the diagnosis of overweight and obesity and another who doesn't. And our job, our challenge, when we look at all of that energy regulatory system that I talk about very simplistically in that slide, there are so many things that are at play um, and to acknowledge those successes and to look at potential uh, interventions that can have the most impact for each individual patient that I get to see. Again, from a public health perspective, all of the work that uh, Let's Go has done and others, and I'm sure Tori will talk about that. But for me personally, the first important thing is to remove that bias and stigma that as parents we put on ourselves, as children as young as three years old, acknowledge and feel bias and stigma. So they feel that. Um, and so I think that's one of the most important things that we can relay to our families that we interface with, your students when you're substitute teaching, to support them in understanding that we're learning so much more about this disease. And that if certain, one intervention has not made the difference for that particular phenotype, then we are obligated to look further for better treatment modalities for each individual patient. And so ultimately having a safe environment to go back to uh, in our communities is vitally important as well. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your saying it's individual and it is kind of rough. I, uh, and you're a provider and I'm wondering how many kids don't have providers, for instance. Most of the kids in Maine don't have the prov provider, Priscilla, because we are very few. There are a handful of providers. But as, as you point out, uh, there's been a- You mean obesity-specific, Alan, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what Priscilla mentioned. And, uh, but we don't blame people for having diabetes. We don't blame people for having cancer. We don't expect them to be able to do some- <clears throat> behavioral maneuver and have those diseases go away. And this is what we've learned about obesity is that actually it's a disease. It's actually a physiological derangement. 
And some people interact with our environment by getting, by becoming obese. And some people interact with our environment and don't become obese. But it's not a volitional or voluntary thing. And these are messages that we need to get out to the public, uh, to the families, and to the children uh, so that they'll be more receptive of getting appropriate health. And now we do have tools that are available for uh, providers that are quite safe and quite uh, uh, effective. So, yeah, um, and I think just, I'm sorry, do you want to, you, you can respond. You go ahead, Becca. And I was just going to say, I mean, there, there's the individual variability that, that Val talked about and that, you know, I talked about in the beginning with that systems map and then recognizing that those individual variabilities interact with all those different factors in our environment. And there's a, a field called epigenetics that that's what people are studying. They're, they're studying how our environment impacts our gene expression. And so on the one hand, we, 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 we care for patients that have obesity and we, we focus on, on the individual variability. On the other hand, we also try to maximize the environmental factors to make sure that they're as healthy as they, they possibly can be. Because um, there is research showing, for example, that um, a, a, a Western diet you know, characterized by high fat, high sugar, high calories, high sodium um, can increase someone's uh, risk for developing obesity because it impacts our, our gene expression. And so trying to pay attention to both the individual factors, but then also the um, the broader environment, uh, broader environmental ones, which is why that chocolate milk debate you're talking about. I mean, similar things like that happen, um, and sometimes we weigh in on, on issues like that. But we also try to pay attention to more like the bigger uh, environmental pictures. Um, but I did bring up, I mean, school food procurement could be considered a very similar issue to what you're talking about with that with that chocolate milk example. Um, so it is, it is complex, uh, but I, I really do want to underscore um, what, what Val was talking about too, and Alan as well, around stigma and around bias and around making it clear that, um, you know, there is some individual, certainly individual choice, but ultimately it's not, it's, it, it's, it's not a choice how our genes express themselves. And so we try to pay attention to both, both of those different angles. Sorry, Tori, I didn't mean to cut you off if you wanted to weigh in. That's okay. I just want to chime in. I'm Dr. Tori Rogers, a pediatrician, the senior director of Let's Go, works a lot on obesity prevention. So I totally agree with you, Priscilla. We, we work with about um, 800 practitioners across the state of Maine to make sure that they have the right tools and resources in front of them to have respectful conversations with their patients and their families around healthy weight and physical activity. And that's really working. We have many, many um, providers that are trained in obesity medicine for treating somebody with obesity, but we train all, all these providers and how they have conversations and um, getting this right start right from the beginning around healthy eating and physical activity. I will say there's some really promising programs and you asked what we could do. There's some new data out that the new changes to WIC and I'm making sure that we have healthier foods at WIC and less juice are paying off. There's really great um, new data around the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and the changes that are made in school cafeterias. Both of those things, new data out that that's reducing obesity. So those are the kinds of things when you ask what we should be doing, and I think Representative Kessler, you asked, are, are we having any new legislation in there? There are lots of things that we can do at a local level, at a state level, and that need to happen at a federal level to support those. And those are things like quality PE, increasing access to healthy foods in the school system and in out-of-school systems, and in our early care and education for our littlest ones, increasing breastfeeding rates. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that we're very interested in. I know at Let's Go and, and, and I know at the Maine Public Health Association also. Thank you, Tori, for chiming in. And I want to turn it over to Representative Kessler. I think you had a question or an additional comment you wanted to make, or maybe we've answered it all already. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for calling on me. Um, I just wanted to first comment on how I appreciate all of your your work on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm here this morning just because I, it, it, it really strikes a chord for me. Um, in my lived experience, I was a morbidly obese person uh, up until I moved to Maine. I had weighed 345 pounds at one point. Um, and I can see how all of these policies and uh, 
uh, things that you had described had an impact on me getting healthier. For example, um, having access to uh, uh, public infrastructure like the Greenbelt Walkway in South Portland, where that helped me uh, walk every day and, and lose a lot of weight there. Um, and also just uh, learning how to to eat better, how to portion things better. And I come from a, a family of people who are obese themselves. Um, I'm the only one who has turned it around because I now live in an environment that is conducive to that. So um, I am in a walkable community where they live in a place where they drive everywhere um, and they don't exercise. So um, I am very much uh, a, I am a willing conduit for any bills that you uh, are, are thinking about. Um, and I also just wanted to comment on just how difficult it is as a citizen legislature to, to really have a strong focus on these particular issues. And um, we need all the help that we can get from you to, to craft the policy. Um, you, you have the brains and the experience and, uh, and I am certainly a, a, a willing conduit, as I was saying before, but um, we need your help in, in, uh, in not ch ch just advocating, but crafting the policy as well. So just wanted to make those comments. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for being here um, and for sharing your, your experience. Um, and I, I did see your, your comment in the chat. And just to build off of that last comment you were making, the bills I mentioned earlier were introduced by other legislators. Um, and we were not, we, we supported them, but we, we didn't introduce them. We are, or we wouldn't have introduced them, but we didn't directly work on, on developing them. Um, we do have um, a couple of bills that are coming up that are connected to uh, funding um, and, and infrastructure for obesity prevention. Um, one is a, an act to establish the Trust for a Healthy Maine, which would uh, fund in part the state's um, state health plan, uh, which would has included obesity uh, as a priority in the past. And um, it also would fund uh, the, the data piece that I was, I was mentioning earlier. So it would ensure that the data are, um, are ag disaggregated by different demographic factors. Um, and then the second bill is, uh, and that one is, is sponsored by Representative Rebecca Millett. And then the second bill in incorporates that uh, as well as a few other things. Um, and those other things include some issues around obesity prevention and that's the standards and there are, that I mentioned earlier, aligning with, with, with federal standards for school food and physical activity, and then a, a couple of, of other components. And that one is uh, sponsored by Representative Rachel Talbot Ross. Um, and it's a, a fairly large omnibus uh, health equity, public health bill, but there are some components in there. So when those are, are ready, I'll be sure to, to flag them uh, for you. Um, and just really grateful again that you're, you're here with us. And, and um, thank you again for sharing your experience. It's nice to, nice to see you and nice to hear from you. Thank you. Heather, I have a question for, for our, a comment and a question for our experts. Yeah, the, comment, the comment is that we have evidence-based treatments for this chronic disease and our, for instance, the main care formulary does not align with the evidence right now. And so I know Valerie and others are working on, on uh, addressing that, but anybody who can advocate for the main care formulary um, uh, aligning with the evidence we know about what works in the treatment of this disease would be very helpful. I'm interested in our obesity experts commenting. Rep Representative Kessler's um, story is compelling, and I'm and I'm wondering if they could comment on how this disease expresses itself differently in different people, and mm -hmm. that somebody else might need a totally different approach to the management of this disease. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Noah. Um, yeah, myself and Tori and Alan and Dr. Burtis, who is an adult obesity specialist working at Maine Medical Center, uh, worked for about two or three years to work with Maine Care at the time with Dr. Chris Pizzullo to adapt the current New Hampshire 
formulary changes that include anti-obesity medications that currently are not covered by Maincare. So to Representative Kessler, absolutely, for your phenotype to have responded to that intervention that you have engaged in has been very effective. And that is wonderful. When we are able to find the treatment that matches whatever is not working well to treat a disease, that's great. Uh, we always start at the foundation, as uh, Dr. Nesson was talking about, those intensive lifestyle therapy goals, environmental factors that we can change and adjust. Um, and when that works, great, we keep it going. But what we know about the disease of obesity, there are different phenotypes. There's different areas of that very complicated energy regulatory system that affects different people differently. And so we have to be able to increase the intervention based on the patient's response. And by doing that, we remove some of that bias that I think Priscilla, you talked about. So if that doesn't work, if what Chris did, which was very effective for his disease process, if that doesn't work, we remove the bias by saying, these are other tools that we have been, that have been studied, well studied um, in the adults, but even in our pediatric population, 20 years ago when I started this work, we didn't have a lot of pediatric data on other tools that Alan talked about, pharmacotherapy or even metabolic bariatric surgery, that now we do have significant evidence. And main care, lack of coverage, and not only main care, some even private insurers are still very hesitant to cover FDA approved medications such as loraglutide that is now currently FDA approved for children as young as 12, or the ASMBS and the AP's policy statement about earlier referral to metabolic bariatric surgery when it's indicated, when we have done all of the other steps, we need to increase our intensity like we do with any other disease. So if your blood pressure gets better by walking and changing your diet, that's great. If it doesn't, we need to have access to the pharmacotherapy for anti-hypertensive medications or anti-diabetes medications. And currently that is still not readily available for uh, 60, 70% of the patients I take care of who rely on main care. So currently, absolutely, we need to do better and work on that policy change. I think, Dr. Nesson, that we're actually at a point uh, where we were with cancer, say, a long time ago. Everybody thought cancer was cancer, and now we know that actually there are, if you will, a zillion different types of cancer, and they require different therapies. You don't treat breast cancer the way you treat lung cancer, the way you treat colon cancer. Uh, Etc. And this is what we're discovering about uh, the obesities, Dr. O'Hara's very important slide, is that with all the genetic controllers and all the complex homeostatic uh, energy regulation system, there's a lot of places where it can break. And if it breaks over here and you're treating over there, you miss. And you have to appreciate that you've got to keep, got to make an effort to figure out where it's broken. Sometimes now we do it mostly by trial and error, but hopefully we'll be, get better markers in the future. Uh, but we're, we're certainly making progress, and, and one of those progresses is addressing obesity as a disease. Thank you both for answering that question and for Dr. Nesson for answering it. Um, it. This does bring us to the end of our town hall this morning, so I want to thank everyone for being here. We do have a quick post-assessment. Um, that I'll ask Becca to put up now. So if you wouldn't mind taking a couple seconds to answer that. As I mentioned, um, we will be putting this recording on our website. The fact sheet is also accessible there, but I'll be sending both out via email, not only to the registrants, but all of our legislators. And again, encourage you to forward the recording to your legislators as well and let them know that we'll be doing a series. Please stay on the lookout in your inbox for information on that series. If you have any feedback on topics you'd like to learn more about, please don't hesitate to reach out and email us and let us know. Um, and likewise, if you have feedback on the definition, we welcome that too. Again, I wanna thank all of our panelists for presenting this morning and, and the great work that they put into this to the obesity member section for planning this morning's event and to all of you and especially to Representative Kessler for taking time to be here. Uh, we really appreciate it and your support of MPHA. So, have a great morning and, and a good Friday and a nice weekend. Thanks, everybody.